Amen. Well, if you have your Bibles, please open up to Second Peter chapter 1. The second letter of Peter chapter 1. We will read verse 16 to 21. And I think we'll have it up on the screen as well. But if not, please look with me. Second Peter chapter 1, starting with verse 16. This is the Word of God. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you the power and coming of our Lord Jesus Christ, but we were eyewitnesses of His majesty. For when He received honor and glory from God the Father and the voice was borne to Him by the majestic glory, this is my beloved Son with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice born from heaven, For we were with Him on the holy mountain. And we have the prophetic word more fully confirmed to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in a dark place until the day dawns and the morning star rises in your hearts. Knowing this first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man But men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And so Holy Spirit, come into this room and speak to us through Your Word that we might be conformed into the image of Christ. And I ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, a few weeks ago, uh, we finished a, a sermon series on neglected virtues where we tried to Uh, go through mainly the Old Testament and find Old Testament narratives that illustrated uh, neglected Christian virtues. And then Pastor John Mark, for a couple of weeks, uh, just did a couple of one-off sermons on things that we thought that the Spirit was leading us to preach on. And now, before we get back into the Gospel of John, because when we get back in, uh, don't take my word for it, you know better than that, but we, we want to finish the book of John once we get back into it, but we are going to, before we do that, we're going to take, a, we're going to take five weeks to do a, a five-week sermon series on the foundations of what it means to be a Reformed church, or a church that is in line with the traditions of the Protestant Reformation. So most of you know this, maybe some of you don't, uh, but the Cross Church is a Reformed church, right? So if, if you go to a Christian function somewhere, uh, and you're around other Christians from other churches, maybe you're at a Sh- the Shane and Shane concert next weekend, and someone says, hey, where do you go to church? And you say the cross, they'll probably say something like this, if they know anything at all, oh, they're Reformed, aren't they? Uh, and, and that's true, that's what most people in the city know us as, for better or for worse. Uh, but most people equate Reformed, or the doctrines of the Reformation, with Calvinism. And it is true that typically uh, there's a, those, those two streams run together, uh, but it doesn't require, being reformed does not require uh, believing in the tulip, all right, or the five points of Calvinism. And we'll talk about that more as we go. Uh, but tonight, uh, what we want to talk about is what it means to be a reformed church, and that's what we're going to talk about for the next five weeks. So what do we mean by the foundations of, of the Reformation. And so many of you have heard of the five solas of the Reformation, right? It's Latin for alone or only. Uh, And so the five solas were the primary emphases on which the Reformers uh, were going to die. These were the hills they were going to die on. These were the primary emphases of the Reformation. Uh, And so these are that the Scriptures alone reveal to us that God saves us, that men can be right with God by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone, to the glory of God alone. So we want to unpack that. And so when we say that we are a Reformed church, that's what we mean. That we are going to stand in uh, the heritage, in the line of the Protestant Reformation, and believe these things, and confess these things. And so we're confessing that 
that we are in line with the faithful men and women who have gone before us and have suffered greatly. Some of them literally suffering, dying, giving their lives in order to preserve the pure teaching of Scripture. And so, uh, one of the vital ingredients of being reformed is being confessional. So I'm not going to preach on what it means to be confessional tonight. You'll hear, you'll, you'll hear uh, Pastor John Mark talk more about that uh, as the weeks go on. But we want to understand rightly the authority of the church. Right? We want to get that because there, the church does have authority. Right? Jesus says to Peter in Matthew 16, 17-19, that He would build His church on, on the rock. He would build it up. And He would give it authority. He said the gates of hell would not prevail against it. And He says, I will give you the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth shall be bound in heaven. And whatever you loose on earth shall be loosed in heaven. So Jesus has given His gathered church, His, His visible gathered church, the authority to bring people into it and remove people from it. He's granted that to the church. However, one of the major beliefs that separate Protestants from Catholics, and this was the heart of the Reformation, is that we do not believe that the church has any authority except the authority that Scripture gives us. Our authority is in Scripture alone. We do not believe that the apostolic line continues through the popery. Right? We do not believe that the church has the same authority to tell men how to live as the Scriptures can tell men how to live. And so churches throughout history have done the hard work of exegesis. And they've drawn out biblical doctrine and, they, and they've systematized that into statements that we call confessions. And, and inevitably, you'll hear people say things like, well, I don't fool with doctrinal statements. That, those are just the traditions of man. Just give me the Bible. That's all I want. Just give me the Bible. And guys, the, the purpose of confessions is not to establish the traditions of man, but to preserve the unity of what the Spirit has revealed in the Scriptures. To preserve that. To capture that. Uh, that doesn't mean that confessions are infallible. They're not. It doesn't mean that we won't look back and see errors from certain times. It doesn't mean that we won't look back and see that the church was blind to certain things in certain times because of culture or other circumstances. We always gauge the confession according to Scripture. But church, the Spirit promises unity. Do you know that? He promises unity in the church regarding the essential matters of the faith. That's why there's not been a whole lot of of disagreement over the essentials of the faith for the last 2,000 years. There's been unity. The way of salvation, the reality of Christ being fully God and fully man, the doctrine of the Holy Spirit, the way to know God. These things have been agreed upon throughout church history. And I, and I know in our culture, there's sort of this badge of honor for people that kind of get off the status quo and go kind of stand on their own over here somewhere. And, and again, you'll hear people say, I'm just done with man. Just give me the Bible. And let the Spirit reveal to me what He's going to reveal to me. And they separate themselves from the church. And guys, I just, I just want to say that is naive and it is arrogant. It's arrogant. We want to be in line with the faithful church that has gone before us. We want to be coming to the same conclusions as the faithful men and women who have examined this book for the last 2,000 years. We want to be in agreement with them. And if we are coming to different conclusions, if we do get off on our own and we're way over here and the rest of the church is way over here, maybe we should say the problem is not with them. Maybe the problem is with us. Why are we coming to completely different conclusions than the church has come to throughout its history? Hermeneutics and theology are done best when done within the context of the local church under the parameters of faithful historical church confession. Now, while all that is important, I'm about to qualify everything I just said. Because this is really important. 
The Scripture alone has the authority to bind our consciences and to dictate what we believe and how we live. And the Scripture alone is the final authority that all confessions and creeds and philosophies and worldviews must be measured by and subjected to. And this is why all good confessions begin with the Scriptures. This is why all good systematic theologies begin with the doctrine of the Word of God. Because while God has revealed Himself generally through creation, He has revealed Himself specially or specifically through Scripture. He has revealed the way of salvation in Christ, in Scripture alone. Our knowledge of God, our knowledge of humanity, the way of salvation, all of this is revealed to us specifically and finally in the pages of Scripture. So we must begin here. We must... We must I think it's good to ground ourselves in confessions, but we must ground ourselves in the testimony of the prophets and the apostles of Scripture. Because at the, at the end of the day, it doesn't matter what I say. It doesn't matter what Luther said. It doesn't matter what Piper says or MacArthur or Calvin. It doesn't matter what any of them say unless the Bible agrees with what we think about the Bible. So we need to find that out. This is why this is so important because today especially, especially if people have kind of uh, brought in the, the postmodern uh, philosophy of the day that's skeptical about how truth is found, people are skeptical of these concepts. They're skeptical of truth. They're skeptical of certainty. And, and if you haven't heard something like this, you will, especially, especially if you hang around universities and, and things like that. You'll, you'll hear, you'll hear, you'll, you will hear people say, you know, this idea that the Scriptures are inerrant, that they're truthful, that they're the final authority that all men must be subjected to, those are Western ideas. Those are, those are products of the, of the age of reasoning. Those are Enlightenment ideas. The early church, the Hebraic church, they didn't believe that. All this stuff about the atonement and heaven and hell and justification by faith and Scripture alone, those are just products of Western thought. Because Westerners wanted certainty and they wanted finality, so they came up with all these things. And even worse, you have some people saying, those are actually just tools for hegemony. All these things about Scripture being final and authoritative, dictating how people live, the powerful just use that to oppress people, to stay in power. Have you heard this? This type of thing is being said all the time by people who hold PhDs and have seats of influence. And so we must, we must make sure that the Bible believes about the Bible what we believe about the Bible. It is not negotiable. And if it does, then we need to see it not in a confession or in history, but in the text of Scripture itself. So what I want to do over the next few minutes is not to give a history lesson on sola scriptura or on the Protestant Reformation, but I want to root us in the text, in this text and in a few others. And I want to give four truths about Scripture and argue for them from Scripture itself. Namely, that the Scriptures alone are inspired. That the Scriptures alone are inerrant or truthful. That the Scriptures alone are authoritative. And that the Scriptures alone are sufficient for faith and for practice. So number one, the Scriptures alone are inspired. Look down at this, this text in, in verse 20. Peter says, Knowing this, first of all, that no prophecy of Scripture comes from someone's own interpretation. For no prophecy was ever produced by the will of man, but men spoke from God as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit. That word for Scripture here is graphe. It, means, it literally means the written word of prophecy. Peter is talking about written prophecies. Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, and all the others. And he's defending the authenticity of the recorded words of the prophets because in his day, 
you had people that were arguing that prophets, although they heard from God and had visions, they had to interpret the prophecies themselves. That's what, that's what people would argue. And, and so Peter here is saying no interpretation of prophecy or of Scripture is from man. But it is God speaking to us through the prophet. Scripture is not from the will of man, but from the will of God. And then he says, carried along. They were carried along by the Holy Spirit. And this is what we mean when we say that the Scriptures are inspired. We mean that the Holy Spirit, through though the writer allows the uh, though the Holy Spirit allows the writer to keep his own uh, craft and his own tendencies and his own writing style, the Holy Spirit is carrying him. He's ensuring that the author produces every word and every phrase that he wants the writer to produce. So this is not inspiration that we think of today. You know, when we say, you know, this, this scene of the sun inspired this poem. Or when we say, you know, this movie was inspired by this event. This, this is not the same thing. You know, one of, my, um, one of the most important parts of my sermon prep is usually somewhere in the middle of the week, uh, I will, I'll have all these thoughts in my head and I'll be really jumbled about where I want to go. And so I'll just, I'll just go outside and run. And I'll just run and I'll think about what I want to say and I'll meditate on the text. And I really do think that the Spirit and the way that I'm built and He made me helps me to process and to think to preach well. But that's not the same inspiration that we're talking about here. We are talking about God speaking through men and saying exactly what He wants to say. He allows the author to operate within His own human volition, yet somehow He ensures that every word is exactly what He wants to be penned. And I confess that there is a level of mystery here. But 2 Timothy 3.16 says, all Scripture is breathed out by God. Theonoustos. So Paul has in mind here the entire Old Testament. Not just the prophecies where it seems that Yahweh is speaking directly through the prophet, but all of the Scriptures. The historical narratives, the prayers, the Psalms, all of it breathed out by God. You know, multiple times in the New Testament, we see the author accrediting the Spirit with authorial credit, uh, authorial credit, but then quoting Isaiah or quoting a psalm. But he'll say, the Holy Spirit said, and then quote the human author of the Scripture. So even though David wrote the psalm, or even though Isaiah made the prophecy, the Holy Spirit was speaking. And again, There's a mystery here as to how exactly this happens, but what is clear is that the Bible believes that its content, its origin is from God, not man. That much is clear. And so, because this is true, because the Scriptures are from God, because they are inspired, because they alone are inspired, the Scriptures also alone are inerrant. Or we could say wholly truthful. The Scriptures alone are wholly truthful. Greg Allison's definition of inerrancy is helpful. He says, truthfulness or inerrancy is an attribute of Scripture by which whatever it affirms corresponds to reality. And it never affirms anything contrary to fact. It also means that Scripture never contradicts itself. The Scriptures are always true. They never attempt to deceive. They never contradict one another. They're not not mythological. Look at verse 16 with me. Peter says, for we did not follow cleverly devised myths. We did not follow cleverly devised myths. Guys, there is no indication whatsoever that the apostles We're trying to pull the wool over people's eyes and to manipulate them and to deceive them. You will not find a hint of that in the New Testament. They believed what they were saying. They were not hallucinating. They they were not hallucinating for 40 years after Jesus died. They were not attempting 
to deceive. They were not trying to pull off a revolution. That's just utterly inconceivable historically. No, he says, look, we are eyewitnesses. We saw Him. We went up on the mountain with Jesus and we saw Him transfigure before us. And we heard God speak to Him from the mountain. We saw it with our own eyes. And all the seeing did, all the experience did, was it confirmed the prophecy from hundreds of years ago. That Yahweh would visit His people. That He would raise up a son from the line of David to lead His people out of exile through a new exodus and visit them and give them everlasting life and a new heaven and a new earth. And he said, these prophecies, these prophetic promises have come to full completion in the Lord Jesus Christ. That's what the author of Hebrews means when he says, in latter times, in many ways, the prophets spoke to our fathers. But in these latter days, He has, he has spoken to us by His Son. Jesus Christ is the full revelation of God. And He Himself says in John 10.36, the Scriptures cannot be broken. So if someone asks you, why do you believe in the truthfulness of the Bible? You can say because Jesus believed in the truthfulness of the Bible. And He's God. And He's King. And whatever He says goes. And if He believes that the Scriptures were about Him, then they're true. That's our apologetic. You know, it's interesting when you read through the Gospels. It's interesting to see Jesus dealing with the Pharisees concerning Scripture. Because, because while they argue over the interpretation of the passage, they never argue over the authenticity of the passage. Isn't that amazing? There's never a, there's never a debate. Is, did Moses really write this? Or is this prophecy really from Isaiah? That's never even coming up. They believed that their Bible was true. He always spoke and acted as if he believed that all the Scriptures were true and he believed that they were all about him. Remember what he said in Luke 24 to his disciples after his resurrection. He said, These are the words I spoke to you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And then it says, Then he opened their minds to understand the scriptures. You know, think about all the literary genres of the Bible. You've got historical narrative. You've got uh, Moses going up a mountain and actually getting tablets written by God. You, ha you have um, prophets prophesying. You have prophets writing. You have psalms praying to God. You have lamentations. You have uh, apocalyptic literature full of symbolism. All of it. All of its different literary genre. All of its different function. And Jesus believes it's all about Him. Therefore, it is true. And you know, when we talk about inerrancy, I think the problems people have with that is they think that that means that there's no seeming contradictories or discrepancies. As if, as if we would rather just have an angel like all, like all the false religions, you know how they have an angel that comes and gives the Scriptures? It's, it's almost like we want that. We want this perfectly, mechanically written book from an angel that has no apparent discrepancies or flaws in it. But that's not how the Scripture comes down to us. What inerrancy means is that when we interpret rightly what the author said, there's never a discrepancy. There's never a contradiction. And that everything, every message is true. Fully true from God. Matthew and Luke can tell the same story with a different point of view. They can choose to leave out different, uh, different uh, guidelines and different uh, parts from that story. But when we interpret them rightly next to each other, we are getting the truth from God. Now, the major objection to this is that, well, since Scripture was written by humans... And since humans are sinful and fallible, then that must mean Scripture to some degree is fallible. And I think here, 
that the, the Article 9 in the Chicago Statement of Biblical Inerrancy, which was written in 1978, R.C. Sproul had a, had a lot to do with that. It was really when higher criticism was huge in the academy, and there was a huge argument over, over this, over the truthfulness of Scripture. And they wrote, and they said, we affirm that inspiration, though not conferring omniscience, guaranteed true and trustworthy utterance on all matters of which the biblical authors were moved to speak. And they say, we deny that the finitude or the fallenness of these writers by necessity or otherwise introduce distortion or falsehood into God's words. So we have confidence that the Scriptures are God's Word, not because we have confidence in men, but because we have confidence in our God. And if God wants to use broken and sinful men to pin perfectly true Scripture, He is free to do that, and He will accomplish that. And so we should put our rest not in men, but in the truth of God. Trust in the truthfulness of Scripture because your God is a God of truth. Because your Christ is true. Because His Word is true. Now, here, here is where the rubber meets the road. Because I imagine that every person in this room who's a believer would probably affirm everything I just said. Most of us do not have a problem affirming that the Bible is inspired or inerrant. As a matter of fact, you could probably look at almost every doctrinal statement from every church, every Protestant church in this town, and you would probably find some language that would lead you to believe that they affirm the doctrines of the inspiration and the inerrancy of Scripture. But how do we really know we believe that? How do you know that you believe that? This leads to point number three. Because the Scriptures alone are inspired and inerrant, by implication, they alone are authoritative. The Scriptures alone are authoritative. 2 Timothy 3.16 again, All Scripture is breathed out by God and profitable for teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Psalm 19.7, The law of the Lord is perfect. Reviving the soul. The testimony of the Lord is trustworthy. Making wise the simple. And again, the Chicago Statement on Biblical Inerrancy in Article 2. They say, we affirm that the Scriptures are the supreme written norm by which God binds the conscience. And the authority of the church is subordinate to that of Scripture. So let me ask you, is your conscience bound by the Word of God? You know, it, this, is, this is a fear that I have for this church and for myself, especially as we move into this new building, that we will somehow believe that because we have a historic doctrinal statement and because our pastors are Calvinist and because we have a high view of Scripture and we don't have lights and fog and we don't entertain people, that we will convince ourselves that we are a biblical church because of those things. That's a danger for us. That is a danger that we must watch for. I want to caution us. Are we seeking to conform every thought, every deed, every action to the Word of God? Not just in matters of salvation or matters of theology or doctrine, but everything. Every piece of our lives. Are we thinking about our money in terms of Scripture? Are we thinking about our work through the lens of Scripture? What about our parenting? You know, what, what does it say about a church who affirms these things, who believes these things, who says, yes, the purpose of marriage is to honor God, the husband is to love his wife like Christ loved the church, but yet the husbands never move beyond providing physically for their families. What does, it, what does it say about a church when we confess, yes, God the Father is a good Father. He's taught us how to raise our children. Yet we refuse to use the rod wisely 
because we don't think it's a good idea. Or because our culture says it's harmful. Does the Bible bind your conscience when it comes to politics? Or are we being tossed to and fro by every political uproar that we see? Does the Bible bind your conscience when it comes to how you think about COVID-19 or vaccines or educating your children? You know, for, that we have a lot of people in the church who are thinking about getting married. Does the Bible bind your conscience in your selection of a spouse? Does it bind your conscience in terms of what you will do with your fiancé before you get married? What about the way we spend the last 20 years of our lives? What about the way we invest our money? We could go on and on and on about these practical issues. Is the Bible our final authority? It is useless to say that we are a biblical church if we are not constantly submitting our lives to what is written. And this is not a rebuke. Please do not hear this as a rebuke. I affirm you, church. I think we do this really well. I think we do this really well by the grace of God. But we can always grow in this. And we, also, we always must be watchful. And culture has a really hard time with this. Right? Because God writing to us is, is a cool romantic idea. Oh, God just loves us so much that He gave us a book to speak to us. Until Jesus demands that our sexual ethic be in conformity to His sexual ethic, then it's not a good idea anymore. Then it's outdated material. The Bible is authoritative because its source is divine. You know, you've heard that cliche, the Bible said it, so that settles it. Right? There's truth. There's, that's true. And I would just add, the Bible said it, therefore God said it. So that settles it is our view of the Bible that God is speaking. And lastly, point number four. The Scriptures alone are sufficient. The Scriptures alone are sufficient. If you look back at, at, in chapter 1 in this chapter in Second Peter, in verse 3, he says, His divine power, so Christ's divine power, and by implication, His Word, because we see throughout Scripture, God's Word and God's person being used interchangeably. He says, His divine power has granted to us all things that pertain to life and godliness. Through the knowledge of Him who called us to His own glory and excellence, by which He has granted to us His precious and very great promises, so that through them you may become partakers of the divine nature. So in short, I think Peter is saying that it is through knowing God in the way that He has revealed Himself in Scripture through the promises that we receive the, the divine power to put sin to death, to put the old man to death, and to walk in the newness of life. And that through that, through that divine power, we have everything we need for life and for godliness. He says all things that pertain to life and godliness. Some people believe that the Scriptures are sufficient only for matters of faith. Right? So they'll say Scripture can lead us to salvation, but not for how to live. Not, not how to think about the creation of the world. But just how to be saved. But we believe in the Reformation and many people for thousands of years, the faithful church has always believed that the Scriptures are sufficient for faith and for practice. So again, Greg Allison says, sufficiency is an attribute of Scripture whereby it provides everything that people need to be saved and everything that Christians need to please God fully. You know, and, and when we believe this and when we say things like this, there's always going to be this objection, um, you, you know, and, and it, it comes because people think, well, you're saying that all, just all you need is the Bible. You know, I hear this in, in biblical counseling when we deal with things like schizophrenia, things that are physiological, or maybe someone fell and, and hit their head and they have brain damage. 
right? And we try to counsel people like that with the Word of God. We get accused. You just think you just need the Bible and that's it. And, and I would say, no, that is not what we are saying. That is a misrepresentation of what we mean by sufficiency. We are not saying that the Bible is sufficient to tell us everything about everything under the sun. But what we are saying is that the Scriptures are sufficient to tell us how to think about everything and how to do everything to the glory of God. Right? So the Bible is not sufficient to tell the businessman all the fine details of how to run his business. It doesn't tell us how to run an Excel spreadsheet. Right? Nobody's arguing that. But it does tell him that he should deal honestly. It does tell him that he should pay his, his employees on time the agreed upon wage that he promised to give them. It does tell the businessman that he should think about his influence and his profits biblically. So instead of using them to oppress the weak and to exploit the poor for more gain, he will use his influence and his profit for good in the earth and to bless the ministry of the church. The Scriptures tell him that he is in sin no matter how wealthy he gets. And like all men, he has fallen short of the glory of God. It tells him how to be saved. It tells him that he needs to be a member of a local church. It tells him that he needs to use his profit for the ministry of the local church. It tells him that he should take a day off and not idolize his job and to spend quality time with his family and his children and serving in his church. So while every detail about running a business is not in the Bible, the businessman only needs the Bible to do his job to the glory of God. That's what we mean by sufficiency. So whatever occupation you hold, whatever season of life you're in, whether you're a child or a spouse or you're nearing the end of your life or whether you're in school or in the prime of your career, whatever you are in, the Bible is sufficient alone to teach you how to honor God in whatever circumstance He has placed you in. The Scriptures alone are sufficient for that. And this is why we reject church growth strategies. Right? And all these different ideas and methods to prop up. Right? You've heard that. We want to prop up what the Spirit is doing. We want to be relative so that people will be interested in coming in. We reject all that because we don't need it. The Spirit doesn't need anything of, all, of the flesh to prop up what He is doing. The Spirit working through the Word, through the normal means of the local church, is what we need. And the Puritans and the Reformers had such a high view of that. They had such a high view of the Spirit working through the Word that they rejected all worldly influences coming into the church. And we should reject all worldly influences coming into the church. We have His Word. We have His Spirit. We don't need to prop that up with other measures. We don't need to make ourselves look entertaining to the lost. We need conviction. We need righteousness. We need biblical preaching. You know, and it's the same thing with, with secular ideologies that claim to progress humanity in a moral sense. Yet their starting points are antithetical to the Bible. They don't have a biblical view of God. They don't have a biblical view of anthropology, of man. They don't interpret humanity in light of what God has said about humanity. They don't have a biblical view of sin. And therefore, they don't have a, a desire to be saved because they don't understand sin. Therefore, the Gospel is rejected. And when the Gospel is rejected, you can't have real reconciliation and you can't have real, real forgiveness. And so there's all sorts of secular ideology, ideologies who are starting with wrong starting points. And we reject those. You know, I think about secular psychology and, and what we call the integrationist approach, which is that Christian counselors should use secular uh, teaching and secular thought and just sort of let it be informed by Scripture. And I have no doubt in my mind that those counselors are doing good and they love God and they love people and they truly want to help. But what typically happens is those secular the, uh, ideologies 
end up being the engine and the driving force. And the Scriptures are just sort of over here, just kind of in, in the background. You know, we, we can talk about critical race theory and intersectionality. There's a huge conversation about this right now. I'm sure every one of you have heard. There's all this talk about, can we use it? Can we bring it in? Can we let it be an analytical tool? And people say, why would the church reject that? It's fighting racism. Why would we reject critical race theory and intersectionality? And it's because we don't need it. Not, not being controversial. We don't need it. The Bible teaches us about the sin of partiality. The Bible teaches us about oppression and exploiting people for gain. The Bible teaches us about God's hatred of oppression and oppressing the weak. It teaches us about true repentance, true righteousness, true forgiveness, true penitence through the cross of Christ. The Bible teaches us that there will be a time, and even now in the church invisible, but a time in the new heaven in the new earth will all people of all tribes and all races and ethnic backgrounds will be surrounded around the throne of Christ together worshiping Jesus. And all of the hostility, all of the racial hostility will be melted at the feet of Jesus because He has broken it in His death on the cross. Making one man out of the two and reconciling all peoples to Himself. The Bible speaks to these things, church. And it is sufficient to lead us. But yet someone may say, people throughout history have had the Bible. And they haven't done what they should have done. They haven't led humanity and progressed humanity the way they should. That was Sigmund Freud's argument. He looked around at all the problems people were having and he said, the pastors aren't doing their job. That was his argument. The, the pastors are ill-equipped to handle the issues of the soul. So he said, let the pastors preach and handle the church and let's, let counselors and psychologists deal with the inner man. And he was right in that day. The pastors were not doing what they should have been doing. But that's not a defect in the Bible. There's nothing wrong with the Scriptures. And someone else may say, yes, but people throughout history who have who have held this book highly, have done horrible things and committed great iniquities. And we should, we should own that. We should acknowledge that. We should mourn over that. But the, the reason is because the evil hearts of men, not a discrepancy in the Scriptures, brothers and sisters. And what, what we need and what the world needs more than anything is the church to come back to the Bible and to obey it and to preach it and to see what it says. To do the hard work of exegesis. To pull out what God says about all these matters. And to practice it. That's what we need. And so, the Word of God is sufficient because it alone deals with humanity's problem of sin. And it points men to their only hope to be saved, to be reconciled to God through faith in the Son of God who willingly gave Himself to be crucified as a replacement for us. Making atonement with His own blood to reconcile sinners to God. And so in closing, church, we should be people who ask why. Why am I doing this? Why do I believe that? Where is the biblical warrant? Where's the biblical warrant, Pastor, for doing what you do on a Sunday morning? Where's the biblical warrant, Dad, for the way you lead your family, for the decisions you make? Where's the biblical warrant for all the things that we do, for all the things that take up our time and our energy and our money? We should strive to be people of the book because John says in 1 John 5.3, For this is the love of God, that we keep His commandments. And His commandments are not burdensome. This is not legalism, brothers and sisters. 
This is not begrudgingly following a book of rules that we hate. This is the way of righteousness. This is the way that that yields to peace in our homes, peace in our church, peace in our societies. This is the way that leads to prosperity. This is the way that leads to dealing with whatever God puts us in to deal with to the glory of God. His Word is a lamp unto our feet and a light unto our path. Let's walk in the light, church. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You, Lord, for Your Gospel. Lord, there's no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. And so, Lord, I pray that if there are any lost in this room, that You would lead them to know You, Jesus. That You would convict Holy Spirit concerning sin and righteousness and judgment. And Lord, for Your church, we ask that we could be people who are bounded in our consciences, in our thoughts, in the deepest, most inner parts of our being by Your Word. And we pray that You would be honored in this church. And as we do that, Lord, we pray that we would be a faithful testimony of the work of the Gospel in a light post in this city. And I ask all that in Jesus' name. Amen.